If you got a Bible, open up to 1 Thessalonians with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Today we're talking about community, specifically this value that we have called genuine community, and along with that, the value of generosity, uh, what I believe is the manifestation of true community, as the scripture teaches us, is the act of, of, of being generous. And so along those lines, real quick, if you're a member at Living Hope, uh, either last night or, or this morning, you, you should have gotten an email from us uh, with our proposed budget for uh, 2021 into 2022. Uh, that, that goes out two weeks in advance of our membership meeting where we vote to approve that budget, Lord willing. Uh, that will be on August 29th. And so between now and the 29th, the next two weeks, if you have any questions about what you see there, uh, you can hit up any of our elders. They're listed there alongside the proposed budget. We would love to help make sense of our proposed budget for the, for the coming year for you. Uh, we're in this series that we started last week called Reboot. And we're looking at what does it look like for, for us as a church to go back to the basics, to go, to go back to the, the structures, the, the values, the practices, the, the things that make living hope, living hope. And so last week we started with what I believe is sort of our paragon value, the, the value of gospel centrality. As we saw in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says, I made known to you what was of most or first importance that Jesus suffered in accordance with the scriptures, that he died, that he was buried, that he was raised to life in accordance with the scriptures. And Paul says, this is the thing upon which this truth, this knowledge of who Christ is and what he's done for us. That is the foundation for the local church. With it, God does the, the, the unthinkable and the unimaginable. With, with the truth of the gospel, miracles happen. Without it, it doesn't matter what we do. Because as Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we, we talked last week about gospel centrality and, and we ended last week by looking at how centering on the gospel creates a gospel culture. Today, we're gonna unpack that. Our, our value for that is what we call genuine community or honest community. And then the emergence of that is the, a life of generosity. So we're gonna unpack those two values today, generosity and genuine community. And we're gonna do so by looking here in 1 Corinthians chapter two, where the apostle Paul tells the, or I'm sorry, First Thessalonians uh, chapter two, where, where Paul tells the church in Thessalonica that these are the things, the qualities, the, the characteristics that he aspired to, uh, to model for the church so that the church would become the type of church or the type of community that, that God had intended. And he writes to the church in Thessalonica here in chapter two, these things. Uh, we're going to look at verses one through 11 this morning. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward the believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own glory and kingdom. And this is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we enter in today um, in the midst of a world that, that seems to be at times coming apart at the seams. For places like Afghanistan and, and Haiti, we, we pause and ask for your mercy. We ask for peace to reign. We ask for help to come. 
for, for places even in our own neighborhoods and in our own nation with frontline medical workers and those in hospitals and emergency rooms right now that are, again, continuing to fight back the encroaching pandemic. Lord, we, we ask for you to supply them with what they need to carry out what you've called them to do. Lord, protect us, help us, heal us. And Lord, I know that today in, in a world such as this that is fraught with conflict and controversy and all of these other things, Lord, you, you want your church to shine through. You desire for your people to model the alternative reality of your kingdom that has now come in and through Jesus as your spirit compels us to model for the world a, a different way of life. And so God, as we, as we see that in your word this morning, would you empower us by your spirit to be those sorts of people? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I think probably the most formative uh, experience in my, my ministry goes back to the, my very first call to, to, a, to a local church. When I was 24, I think, 23, 24, uh, I, I took a, a position or a role on a church staff in a small Baptist church north of Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I was the, the student pastor or, or the youth pastor. And, and I had come into that role or into that, that, that calling with uh, some measure of uh, excitement. I'd been sort of a child or a product of, of student ministry. It was all the rage in those days. And so I, I felt like I had a really good idea of how I wanted to shape the youth ministry and the culture I wanted to see um, kind of formed there. But when I, when I arrived on the scene, I realized I was going to be doing youth ministry different than every other youth ministry or youth pastor I had ever seen or known to that point. Uh, because my first gathering with, with my youth ministry happened on a Wednesday night, and half the students in the student ministry were either expectant teenage mothers or, uh, or teenage moms. And and so I immediately was like, okay, this is, this is unique. This is, this is different. What's going on here? And the, the people who had worked in, in the ministry informed me. There was a Baptist Homes for Children just down the road. And there were two particular cottages there that housed girls who had been removed from their homes, kicked out of their homes, stayed involvement in, in their homes, uh, where they could go into a safe place while they were expecting or, or even in, into the early years of, of, of raising these, these kids. And so I became the first youth minister I'd ever known of that had to coordinate youth ministry and children's ministry simultaneously. Like when we went to kids camp, when we went to church camp, I had to find uh, child care workers. We, we had to basically do a side, uh, a side camp for the kids that were in our ministry and then a whole other thing for, for the students in our ministry. Not only that, uh, but, but the complexity of the girls that were coming into our ministry from the, the situations they were in was really difficult. Like one of my, my most formed memories of this was the first night that Haley came to our student ministry. Uh, Haley was probably six or seven months pregnant, beautiful young lady. She was, I think, 15 at the time. Uh, and, and she had come up with the other girls. It was her first night there coming from a really hard situation that at the time I knew nothing about. And so I walked up to her, and as I always did with the new students, I said, hey, my name's Pastor Gibb. So glad you're here. Great to have you. And I stuck up my, my hand to shake her hand. And she goes, and just looked away from me. And for probably the next month, refused to make eye contact, did not communicate it was just, it was hard. And so uh, I had learned from some of the ladies who had been working with them over the years how to kind of uh, navigate those challenges, how to go from hostility to resistance, which we were welcome to see resistance at that point, like, oh, she at least acknowledged that I exist. And then to, to having conversation to eventually, over the course of years, seeing God do amazing transformative work in the lives of, of these young women. In fact, several years, fast forward several, several years, I'm here at Living Hope. I get a phone call from Maryland, and it's Haley, just updating me on what's been happening in her life and what happened after she transitioned out of the home. It was a gift from God. I look back on that and I think, okay, there was something in that experience though, something that was formative for my vision of what the local church could and should be. That, that what if the church was this safe place? What if the church could be a place where those who had experienced all the, the hostility and the brokenness of sin, who had made some very bad decisions or hard decisions, what, what if the church could be the place where healing and restoration and redemption happened at the relational level as well as at the theological or biblical level? In other words, what if hearing the good news of the gospel and then seeing it embodied in the way that we interact with and love one another, what if... What if the church could be about that? 
So for the past 15 years here at Living Hope, we've had various ways of describing it. The word we've sort of settled on here recently is just genuine community. Uh, community is kind of a buzzword. There's all manner of ways of talking about it and thinking that you can find it. We've put the qualifier genuine on the front end of that but because when you look at the New Testament, the New Testament, New Testament is ruggedly honest about what was going on in the local church. It, 1 Corinthians, we talked about that last week. There's all sorts of dysfunction. Philippians may very well be a letter that was written just to resolve conflict between two women at the church of Philippi. The, the Thessalonian church, the church in Thessalonica that we're looking at, appears to have been a little bit lazy in anticipation of the second coming of Jesus. Like the, the, the Bible, the New Testament is unbelievably honest to a fault about what the, the makeup of the local church is. It's It's, it's true but it's also ruggedly hopeful about what can happen when the Holy Spirit of God and the truth of the gospel come to rest in and through a local church such that this new thing is born, that this local church experiences community in a new and compelling way. Now, we see here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I believe the Apostle Paul talking about the characteristics of what made his efforts, along with the other apostles there, uh, an attempt to construct genuine community. I'm going to give you four things. That's right, not three, four. You get a bonus point this week. Four characteristics that make up genuine community that I think as we talk about that at Living Hope, as we talk about rebooting, what are we calling one another to? What are we inviting one another into when we talk about our groups or when we gather together on Sunday? What, what are we aspiring to be as a local church? Four particular attributes that we want to draw out from this text this morning and, and, and try to com compel one another to live into the fullness of what genuine com community can and should be. The first thing is the thing we talked about last week. Uh, genuine community is gospel-centered. We see that specifically in verse 2. I'm not going to elaborate too long on this because uh, there's a whole sermon for that. If you weren't here last week, go back. You'll hear what we're talking about when we talk about gospel centrality. But Paul me mentions it here as well to the church in Thessalonica. In verse 2, he says, Though he had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of of much conflict. He goes down in verse four and essentially says the same thing. God entrusted us with the gospel. Now, now Paul draws attention to the fact that the, the churches that have conflict, that the gospel is the thing that they unify around. We'll talk about that more next week. That there is a rallying point in the local church and it's the good news that Jesus lived our life, died our death and rose again so that sinners can be reconciled to God and we can be made new from the inside out. Paul says that, that's the rallying point. That's the centrality. We are born from above. It's only through the gospel that, that we can become these sorts of people. He, men he mentions Philippi as he talks about this. We were shamefully treated there. And if you go and read the letter to the Philippians, you see Paul do something remarkable as he models gospel centrality for the church at Philippi. Chapter three of the book of Philippians, Paul essentially takes his resume, everything that would have made him someone in society, and he sets it on fire. He says, I was, I'm the Hebrew of Hebrews. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I check all the right boxes. I was in the right crowd. As to a Pharisee, as to a, uh, one who held to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, I persecuted the church. You want a checklist of what it means to be a heavy hitter in the ancient world? It's what Paul talks about in Philippians 3. But then Paul says, but I consider that all rubbish. In light of the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, his righteousness was given to me, Paul says. He suffered on the cross for my sin so that I could be a partaker in his righteousness. A gospel centrality is the only thing that resolves the conflict. It's the only thing that brings us together. It's the only thing that makes genuine community possible. And then there's some things that happen in the lives of those who have been reconciled to God through the gospel that become attributes of genuine community. The second thing is that they become others focused. They're gospel centered, but they're focused on others. Their, 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 their will, their intentions, their motivations is to love, serve, and care for others. We see that in verse one. Paul says, you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that we came to you and it was not in vain. So the whole mission that Paul was bent on, the whole ministry that he was giving his life to was for them. 
It was not in vain. He wasn't building a platform for himself. He wasn't trying to establish some mechanism where his livelihood would be secure for, for the rest of his days. No, he gave his life to the local church because he realized Jesus Christ had given his life to him. And so that, that radical transformation happened where he goes from focused on self to focusing on others. In verse six, he says it like this. We did not seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. So he said, we could have come to you and said, honor us, glorify us, make much of us. But no, instead, his disposition and his bent was towards what was better for everyone else. The, the rest of the New Testament talks about this over and over and over again. In order for the church to be the church, everyone must enter the church with a hope and an anticipation and an expectation of loving and serving others. It will, the church will collapse on itself if it caves in to the consumeristic impulses of the culture around it. It cannot stand. The center can't hold. If all of us enter these doors and say, man, I really hope that the kids' ministry is best for my kids. I hope that the music is what I like. I hope the seats are comfortable. The temperature in the room is what I prefer. If we all take that angle, if we, if we approach church the way we approach our, our favorite place to shop for hardware or for groceries, it will collapse. Paul says the thing that is predicated upon this whole thing working in the name of Jesus Christ is that we come in for the sake of others. In other places, like in the book of Philippians, like in the book of Romans, Paul will say things like this. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. He'll say things like, let each one consider himself with sober judgment. Do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Consider others as more important than yourself. Being others focused is the, is the telos, it's the goal, the orientation of the local church. Without it, the church can't be the church. Third, Paul says that the, the, the genuine community that was constructed, constructed in Thessalonica was constructed to be truth-oriented, to be truth-oriented. What, what does that mean? In verses three through five, you, you see that um, what we're talking about is not just simply that Paul says, I wanna teach the Bible in Thessalonica. No, there was something about his motivations. There was something below the hood, under the surface of why they were doing what they were doing so that the church could be the church. Look at verse three. Paul says, look, when we came there, our appeal did not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. What's he saying? Uh, Paul, Paul's saying that, that, that the, the, the disposition, the orientation of the apostles was to be honest, was to be true in their motivations, to be pure in their desires. And, and so as Eugene Peterson translates this passage, he says uh, in his heading over these, these couple of verses, he says that, that, that there was no hidden agendas in this Lanika. There, there was no ulterior motives. In fact, I, I love how the message reads on this. It says it like this in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. God tested us thoroughly to make sure we were qualified to be trusted with his message. Be assured that when we speak to you, we're not after crowd approval, only God approval. Since we've been put through the battery of tests, you're guaranteed that both we and the message or the gospel are free of error, mixed motives, or hidden agendas. We never use words to butter you up. No one knows that better than you. And God knows we never used words as a smokescreen to take advantage of you. What if the church could be like that? What if, we could, what if, what if church was the place where pomp and pretense and performative actions and posing, what, what if church was the place where all of that died? where real people could be honest about real sin, real, real brokenness, real hurt, real need, real urgency for, for God's deliverance or for the Holy Spirit to do something in our hearts and lives, real dependence upon who God is and what God's done for us in Jesus. What, what if we could be oriented to the truth to that degree? 
what if in a world that is bent on consumerism where everyone kind of comes in saying, what do I get out of this deal? What if instead we were so others focused, we said, we're gonna refuse to play church because it's the dumbest hobby on the planet and instead love one another and be honest with one another and bear one another's burdens and confess our sins one to another. What if, what if, as Paul says here, that's what we were aiming for? I love, it's been sort of a, a, a pinnacle verse for me over the years here at Living Hope as we've tried to architect what could be genuine community. I, I love the way John says it in 1 John 1, 7. When John says there, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We're, we're in the context there. John says, look, if, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar. And, and, and if you continue in sin, you are a liar. And what looks like a really hard paradox there, but in the middle, John gives this statement. And he essentially says, look, we're, we're a people who come together. We don't say we don't sin. We don't continue in sin. We walk in the light together, which is just honesty. It's not perfection. It's saying, man, I've got a ways to go on this sanctification thing. And then God does something in the midst of that honesty where John says, we have fellowship with one another. We have this koinonia, we have this thing that, that is supernatural. We have that together. And in the midst of that, the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all of our sins. Where the gospel's palpable and it's experienced. One of my mentors in the faith says, according to that verse, he says, if you take 1 John 1, 7 seriously, you can be impressive or you can be known, but you can't be both. You can be impressive to other people or you can be honest and be known, but you'll never be both. And so you have to choose. Do you want to walk in the light or not? Ray Ortland writes a lot on this. He's one of my favorite writers on this subject. We talked about it last year when he was, or last week when we were talking about gospel culture. And here's another excerpt from that same piece that he wrote. It says, the most important personal trait in a gospel culture is honesty. And then quoting from 1 John, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his, Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In the context, walking in the light is an honest relationship with Jesus and one another so that we're free to grow. And then he says, this isn't optional. This isn't something we choose to do at some point in time when we feel comfortable with it. This is Christianity. He goes on, he says, in many churches today, nobody admits anything. The social environment of a church can become infested with shaming and posing and blaming and finger pointing and fault finding the opposite of gracious acceptance. That social environment is functional heresy. But in a gospel culture, sinners are safe to own up to their problems and grow together in the Lord. Who wouldn't thrive in that gentle environment of gentle honesty? When I look back on that formative experience of, that I had early on in ministry and, and working with, coaching alongside, serving, loving, pastoring these girls coming from really difficult situations, the thing I loved the most about it was that they weren't buying any salesmanship in Christianity. Like they, they're like, I ain't got time for that, preacher. If you're not honest and real with me, I'm gonna sniff you out. And they were, like they could smell it a mile away. If anyone tried to get their, you know, their, their, their information in, smuggle some kind of truth in through some hokey game or whatever, they were not having it. But if you just approached them and loved them and cared for them, they were like, okay, I can, I can deal with this. This is honest, this is real. This, this actually acknowledges that the world is hard and it's a broken, messed up place and I've suffered some of those consequences and made some bad decisions. That sort of environment that's oriented around living into the fullness of the truth by walking in the light with one another is a place, I believe, where the gospel becomes real. Not just some truth we aspire or we uh, attribute to the scriptures, but something we experience in our lives. Which means that in order for that to be the case, your experience of the local church has to be deeply relational. Now, you've probably heard us say this at Living Hope over the years, but I'll say it again just in case you haven't. We are a highly relational church. And that's not, an, that's not accidental. It's not just that everyone here is like super uber friendly or like that our, our pastors and staff are given bonuses if they shake hands and kiss babies. It's not it at all. We believe that for the Bible to be true and for, for the gospel to be experienced, it's got to be experienced in the context of relationship. 
That's why Jesus didn't just descend from heaven and transmit information on tablets as had happened in the old covenant, but instead he looked men and women in the eye and said, follow me. And he had meals with them and it was invited into their homes and, and taught about the re realities of the world over real world issues. It's deeply relational. And that's the fourth quality I want to unpack just real quick for you this morning. In order for it to be genuine community, it's got to be relationally balanced. What do I mean by that? Paul does something really remarkable in this passage. When he talks about the local church, he compares it to a mom and a dad. I don't know if you caught it. In verse 7, he says, uh, we came to you and, and we treated you in a way that was similar to a mother nursing a baby. Like that was the, the aspiration of the apostles. Verse seven, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. He says, in the, the Greek is really complex here, being affectionately desirous of you. Like there was this aching and longing of the apostles. There was a genuine love, a desire to be together with one another. And then down in verse 11, he says it like this, for you know how we were like a father with his children. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. So Paul's image of, of what it looks like to construct genuine community in the church is the leaders in that church and the people involved in that church, they, they act like a mom and a dad. They're both nurturing and challenging. Nurturing like a mom who, who will come, come alongside you and, 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 and be gentle with you. That's the word that Paul uses to describe it, that will, it will, will, will love you, will genuinely treat you like a mother would a child. But then Paul says it's also like a dad where you're not going to get browbeat into submission, but instead he uses the word exhort there. It's one of my favorite Greek words. It's the word parakaleo. Two words that means basically come alongside and compel. It's, it's that idea of your dad putting his arm around you and saying, you got this. You can do this. Well, I'm with you in this. And Paul says that, that's, the, that's the culture, that's the model that created this genuine community. The church was a place with both nurture and challenge, grace and truth. Or as we say here at Living Hope, the, the ministry of Jesus was one of invitation and challenge. He went to his disciples and he invited them to follow him, invited them to eat with him, invited them to take part in him. And then he challenged them to take up their cross and to die to themselves and to seek first the kingdom of God and not their own stuff. And it's that environment, that culture that creates, I think, a genuine sense of community, honest community, a community that's truth-oriented and, and, and others-focused. We, we use this graph when we teach our small groups a lot over the years. We, Bill introduced us to this several years back, but this is kind of the different ways that invitation and challenge intersect with one another. If you get low invitation and, and, and low challenge, you've got a boring culture because who wants to do anything in that? No one invites me into their life and no one challenges me to do anything. I'm bored to tears in that. You go up though and you get a lot of invitation and no challenge, you get a cozy culture where we kind of eat chips and salsa and talk about football or our favorite reality shows and go on with our lives. But you get like all challenge and no invitation, <clears throat> fundamentalism without the fun. Then you get this stress culture where everyone's trying to perform and no one knows if they're loved or accepted. But if you get it all together, people like Jesus who will invite you into their lives, who are desirous of you, as Paul says here, but also love you enough to help you move towards truth and holiness and sanctification and Christ-likeness and godliness and righteousness, that's an empowered culture. That's where people thrive. And what Paul says here is that a genuine community becomes a community of generosity. That, that is the manifestation of real gospel centrality, other-focused, truth-oriented, relationally balanced culture. They immediately become generous. Let's look, look at verse 8. Verse 8 is the linchpin of this whole thing. He says, so, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. And so I want you to hear this. When we're talking about generosity, we're not just talking about finances. Yes, that, absolutely that. But Paul says it's not just about monetary gifts. It was their very life they were willing to share. They were opening their hearts 
and their homes and their hands. Their, their, their pocketbook and their calendar was opened up to one another. It wasn't just, hey, write a check so we can send them on their way and let them know we care about them and not really get involved with them. No, our very selves, he says, that's what we were willing to share. When, when you look at the book of Acts, I don't think this is an accident. When you look at the book of Acts, these apostles filled with the Holy Spirit, telling the good news of the gospel for the first time in places all throughout the, the Roman Empire, almost without exception, every time Luke records a conversion experience in the book of Acts, the next thing that happens is that people start sharing things. Their, their money, their time, their lives, their gifts, their experiences. Acts chapter two, 3,000 plus people are converted on that day. The very next thing that Luke says is, and breaking bread in each other's homes and sharing with one another as anyone who would have a need. Acts chapter four, same thing. They liquidate a, a field, sell it, give the proceeds to those who are in need. Into the book of Acts, someone comes to faith. What do they do? I'm gonna share my life by going on a missionary journey over and over and over again. Generosity is the manifestation of genuine community. So to the extent that we're experiencing it, that's where it starts to show up. And in order for that to show up, we need a miracle because none of us are innately generous, I don't believe. I think we're innately selfish. None of us are innately other-focused. We're self-focused. We're not innately oriented towards the truth. We're innately oriented towards covering up and shaming. So we need the miracle, the Holy Spirit, and the truth of the gospel to collide in our hearts in such a way today as to where we will be a people who will pursue genuine community, and generosity. So God, we ask for that. That we would not be a withholding people, but a generous people. And that that generosity would show up first off in the way that we give our time, our energy, and our life to one another. And God, cause it to flourish. The world is so bent against this reality. There is nothing about our regular ebb and flow, Lord, that would lead us here. We need your spirit. We need your word. We need conviction that is good that leads to repentance. We need hope that is good that is filled with graciousness and kindness and gentleness towards one another. So God, would you grant it to us even today? In Jesus' name, amen.